Let's discuss a double oscillator system. Here's a spring. It has a natural length of L. That is, it has not been expanded or contracted yet. As a spring constant of K, and on each end it has a mass, and these masses are unequal. So we're going to exert a force on each end until we, until the spring now is compressed from its value of capital L to this length of small l. And we're doing it in such a way that when we're compressing the spring, we're not shifting it to the left or to the right. So that means then that the force that we're exerting on block one, moving it this way, has to equal the force that we're exerting on block two, moving it in this direction. As if, if F1 was greater than F2, then we'd be just shifting everything to the right as we're trying to compress the spring. Likewise, if F2 was greater than F1, so we'd be shifting it to the left. So we're not doing it like that. We're just applying equal force on F1 and F2 so that while we're compressing the spring, there's no translational motion. So F1 and F2, they're equal in magnitude. They're opposite in direction. That means then that the net external force that we're applying to this system is zero. F1 plus F2 add up to zero. And whenever we have a mechanical situation where the net external force applied to it is zero, there's no change in the momentum of the system. Well here, before we started compressing the spring, this was just sitting here. So it had a momentum of zero. Then that means while we're compressing it, the total momentum is zero. Then when we release it, there still is no net external force being applied to this system. So even as the blocks are moving back and forth, there still is no total momentum in that system. So what we're saying then is that the momentum of block one plus the momentum of block two is zero. So of course that means that these blocks are moving with velocities of opposite directions. Also from this equation we can say that well v1 that's magnitude will equal minus m2 divided by m1 times v2. But these blocks are always moving in opposite directions. So if we have it like this, if block one is moving to the left, then block two has to move to the right. So they're working together to expand the spring. Or if block one is moving to the right, block two has to move in the opposite direction so they can work together to contract the spring. Another feature of our system is that the maximum compression that the spring will experience will be capital L minus small l. And the motion of the system roughly looks something like this then. Here we have the spring that has its length of capital L. We compressed it together, these two blocks, so now it has a length of small l. Then we release it. So block one, of course, moves in this direction. Block two moves in this direction. So as they're moving apart, the spring now is going to be expanding. At some point in time, it's going to have its length again of capital L. Well, that happens, though, of course, the blocks keep moving apart until the spring is maximally extended. Then they're going to start moving together again. And as the blocks move together, once again at some point in time, the spring is going to have its value of capital L. But these blocks keep moving together until it's compressed to its the value of small L. 
then they're going to move apart again. What we need to solve in this problem is what is the velocity, what is the magnitude of the velocity of block 1 and block 2 at these points in time when the length of the spring is equal to capital L as it is here and again here. That's what we have to solve for this problem. Now remember I think it was video number 6 when we considered a spring that had a single block attached to it as we have here then we attach a block to it pull it down and release it so that it's going moving up and down well as the block moves up at some point in time this extended spring will once again have a length of capital L which is what it was before we attached the weight to it but the block keeps moving upward further compressing it then it moves back down and as it moves back down at some point in time the spring once again is going to have its length of capital L but the block keeps moving until once again the spring is fully extended of course it keeps moving up and down like that but what we proved in video number six is that at these moments in time when the spring has its length of capital L that's when the block M is moving with its maximum velocity so for our system at these moments in time when the spring has its length of capital L as it does here and here blocks 1 and block 2 are going to have their maximum velocities so when we say we want to determine the velocity of block 1 and block 2 when the spring has its value of capital L what we're saying then is that we want to know what is the maximum velocity of block 1 and block 2 because that's exactly what will happen in this situation and down here. Now remember also from uh, video 6 we had shown that when you have a harmonic system that the maximum potential energy of that system equals the maximum kinetic energy of that system and for our system here what is the maximum kinetic energy of course that's going to be one half the mass of block one times its maximum velocity squared plus one half the mass of block two times its maximum energy its maximum velocity squared and also remember in video number six we determined that the potential energy of a harmonic system equals one half k times the amount of displacement of the spring squared that displacement would be the amount of stretching of the spring or the amount of contraction of the spring and here this will have its maximum value whenever the stretching is maximum or whenever the compression is maximum well for our system the compression is maximum at this value capital L minus small l so for our system the maximum potential energy u max will equal one half the spring constant times the maximum compression big L minus small l that's our maximum compression on the spring so we have big L minus small l squared that's the maximum potential energy and that has to equal the maximum kinetic energy so let's write this up here and see where that takes us
So we have one half. It's one half k, and we have capital L minus small L squared, and we can get rid of these one halves, and we're going to we'll have this k times big L minus small L squared equals m1 times v1, the maximum velocity of block 1 squared. Well, the velocity of block 1 is this. So it's maximum velocity, v1 max, will equal this. And v1 squared it's just going to be this squared, so the minus sign goes away. And we have this. So here then, for v1 maximum squared, we can put this in. It's going to be m2 squared divided by m1 squared. And then we have this, v2 maximum squared plus from here we have m2 v2 maximum squared and here we have m1 squared here we have m1 so these will cancel and down here we'll just have m1 Okay, so here we had v1 maximum squared. That's this. So put this into here. We end up with this expression now. And we have this term yet. So we can obviously factor this out. And we have a pretty simple equation then. We have k times capital L minus small l squared equals m2 squared divided by m1 plus m2 v2 maximum squared and this looks like we can rewrite that easily enough that would be m2 squared plus m1 times m2 divided by m1 times v2 maximum squared equals this. So this equals this. So v2 maximum squared, we can keep it in better focus now. This v2 maximum squared will equal m1 times this, m1, and again, capital L minus small l squared, then it's going to be divided by this. m2 squared plus m1 times m2. So here we have the maximum velocity of block 2 squared, but it's, a, it's expressed in terms of the length of the spring what the spring, the length of the spring after we compressed it down, and then the value of these two masses. And if we want, we could multiply this top and bottom by 1 over m1 divided by 1 over m1. This is multiplying by 1, of course. These will cancel. We have this denominator times 1 over m1, 
So this will equal L minus L squared. With something here, we have this K that belongs right there. We have K L minus L squared equals this. So we're multiplying both sides of the equation by this reciprocal. So we have M1 times K L minus L squared divided by this. And then we're multiplying top and bottom by 1 over M1. So this will be K times L minus L squared divided by M2 squared plus M1 times M2 divided by M1. So here, V2 maximum squared, the maximum velocity of block 2, it depends upon the spring constant, the total length minus the compressed length of the spring, and then these masses. Of course, we can say that V2 maximum that will equal the square root of K L minus L squared divided by M2 squared plus M1 times M2 divided by M1. So there is the maximum velocity of the second block and that occurs at these moments in time when the length of the spring is capital L here and here and then of course as we determined before, V1 max that's just minus M2 divided by M1 times the maximum velocity of V2 where that's our final expression for it, the velocity of block 2 and Block 1, that's just minus M2 over M1 times that. And the minus sign, of course, indicates that these blocks are always moving in opposite directions. So that's the problem that we wanted to solve for this video. And again, we made use of um, some of our principles that we had derived in video number 6. What we're going to do in the next video is consider the same double oscillation system. What we want to know is what is the natural frequency of oscillation for these two blocks. We know that if we have a single spring, with a mass attached to it, and it's going back and forth like this and we have a spring constant K we know that it has a natural frequency omega equal to the square root of K over M well this spring that has a spring constant of K but there's two masses attached to it not just one and these masses are also unequal so for our double oscillator system what would be its natural frequency of the motion of these two blocks. That is what we will solve in the next video. I think that will be video number 12. And again, um, to remind you, the playlist for this um, series, Analytical Mechanics, along with all the other playlists, is at the website, digital-university.org.